So the preface and part one of Kant's groundwork for the metaphysics of morals is really interesting. There's a lot of stuff in here. Most of that is for you to sort of discover as you read through it, as you do the quiz, as you annotate on perusal, things like that. This video will cover sort of three main topics. So first, the project in this book, what is Kant doing? Number two, why does Kant think morality has to be based on rationality rather than uh, what he calls inclination? And third, the sort of brilliance or the interesting nature or the magic nature of Kant's answer to what is morality based on if we base it on reason. Or how does morality work if we base it on reason? So, part one, the project and the groundwork. So, if we look at uh, what Kant says, so this is at the end of the preface, he discusses what is this book going to be about. He says, the method I have taken in this work, I believe, is the one best suited if one wants to take the way analytically from common cognition to the determination of its supreme principle, and then, in turn, synthetically from the testing of this principle and its sources back to common cognition. So it's like, whoa, what's going on there? So he wants to take the way analytically from common cognition to determination of its supreme principle. So first, we start with common cognition. So basically, what do people think about morality? What's the typical thought about morality? So common cognition, typical thought. So what do people typically think about morality? What's the general idea about morality? What do people have in mind when they're thinking about morality? So what's the typical thought? And we want to go from this thing to the determination of its supreme principle. So what is the sort of underlying principle or what determines the underlying principle or the supreme principle or the main principle of morality and of common thought about morality? So what's sort of behind common thought, what underlies, what undergirds the sorts of things people say about morality. So look, people say all sorts of stuff about morality. They say this is right, this is wrong, blah, blah, blah. So what is the sort of core undergirding principle? What's the thing animating that or explaining that? And he wants to figure this out analytically. So what he means is that he wants to figure out sort of basically by definition what is animating the common thought about morality. So like people say lots of stuff by mor about morality, but sort of like by definition or necessarily, what is morality? What is the core of morality? So if we had to sort of define morality, what would it be? So that's what he wants. That's sort of step one. And then he wants in turn, synthetically from the testing of its principle and its sources back to common cognition. So synthetically what we're doing, it means, um, sort of expanding our scope and not just like in the definition of morality, but also in all of its implications. So now that we've found, we'll eventually find the supreme principle. We find the supreme principle, we figure out what does it imply? Like given the supreme principle, what can I derive from the supreme principle? What kind of rules does it lead to or whatever? And then I test this principle and its implications and its sources back to common cognition. So I'm sort of testing and I'm looking at this principle, maybe giving various examples, examining it from various angles with the goal of sort of arriving back at where we started, which is what we typically think about morality, specifically back to common cognition in which its use is encountered. And so find the supreme principle of morality and then look at how it works when we put it into use in common moral questions. So that's the project, he says, figure out what is the supreme principle of morality and figure out how it works. And he says, look, I split it up into three sections. Transition from common rational moral cognition to philosophical moral cognition. Section two, transition from popular moral philosophy to the metaphysics of morals. Third section, final step from the metaphysics of morals to the critique of pure practical reason. These three sections, I don't know how clearly they line up with this thing above. Start with common thought, find the principle, test it out. But basically what we're going to do in the first section is find the common principle, find the, find the underlying principle of common thought. And in the second section, we're going to test it out a lot. And so basically in the first two sections is mostly where we do all of this stuff. And then the third section where we sort of step from the metaphysics and morals to the critique of pure practical reason is going to be sort of like 
metaphysical questions or theoretical questions about morality. And you'll see what those are when we get there. But if we just look at how he describes the sections, section one, we start from common rational moral cognition to what, what people typically think about morality, rationally speaking, to philosophical moral cognition, which is sort of a philosophical way of thinking about it. Then in step two, we go from popular moral philosophy, so the thing where we ended, the philosophical way of thinking about it, to the metaphysics of morals. So what is that? Well, he'll have talked about this when you read it up here, what a metaphysics of morals is. And then from metaphysics of morals to critique of pure practical reason, which he also talks about, but it's very hard to tell what he's saying. So I don't know if I'd take these section divisions very uh, clearly as mapping on to this. It's kind of hard to do that. But I think he's right about what he's doing in these three sections. And he's right about what he's doing here. I don't know how what he does here fits into the three sections, but basically this is the project. Start with what we know about morality, just commonly speaking. Figure out the principle, test out the principle, see what happens. So that's his project in the groundwork, which we're about to read. Number two, the irrelevance of inclination to morality. So as you read this uh, first section, so after the preface, you'll read the first section, and as you read this, you'll find out Kant thinks we cannot base morality on what he calls inclination. As the reading quiz will sort of explain, inclination is like another word for desire or urge or want. Uh, I don't think the reading quiz uses the word want, but want is another synonym. So an inclination is something sort of inside of you and it's something that like pushes you to get something. You're inclined to do, to do one thing or you're inclined to do another thing. Maybe you're inclined to sleep in in the morning, or you're inclined to wake up early, or maybe your inclinations change from day to day. Uh, you know, you have different inclinations one day, depending on how sleepy you are. So those are what inclinations are. And we haven't, we've seen Aristotle, for Aristotle, inclinations are very important to morality. The virtuous person will have the right sorts of desires. So they won't want to, eat everything, they're not going to be like a glutton, they won't want to eat nothing, they'll want to sort of eat the right kind of food in the right amount. They won't want to always rush into battle no matter what, they won't want to always run away from battle, they'll want to fight when it makes sense to fight. They won't want to give away all their money no matter what, they won't want to hoard all their money and be greedy, they want to give away the right amount of money. So for Aristotle, inclination is very important to morality. And for one of Kant's predecessors, inclination was very, well, for lots of Kant's predecessors, but for one in particular, inclination was very important. This was David Hume. So David Hume had a moral theory which was built entirely on inclinations and desires, mostly. I mean, those were the main thing. And the thought is that morality is kind of built up from what we want. Humans have urges, and the right thing to do is ultimately going to be determined by the urges that we have. That's not how Aristotle thought. For Aristotle, inclinations were important, but it's not like they're the whole of morality. For Hume, inclinations were everything. Morality is built on desire. It's built on what we want. And Kant's project in this book is a full-scale rejection of inclination as a basis for morality. He thinks inclination cannot have anything to do with determining the supreme principle of morality. And he gives three reasons for this. He thinks we can't allow inclination to decide what morality is about. Reason number one, uh, I labeled the scope of morality or morality scope. This is on page five. This you'll look at in your reading quiz. The reading quiz has a question about this, so you can sort of figure this out as you read. I'm going to discuss the next two reasons why inclination can't play a role in determining morality for Kant. So reason number two is on page five through seven. Uh, this is the sort of fickleness of inclinations, according to Kant. So let's take a look. Whoops, we're too far. So he says, morals themselves remain subject to all sorts of corruption as long as that guiding thread and supreme norm of their correct judgment is lacking. For as to what is to be morally good, 
It is not enough that it conform to the moral law, but it must also happen for the sake of this law. Otherwise, that conformity is only contingent and precarious, because the unmoral ground will now and then produce lawful actions, but more, action, but more often actions contrary to the law. But now the moral law in its purity and geniusness, which is precisely what most matters in the practical, is to be sought nowhere else than in pure philosophy. So what in the world is going on here? So he says, look, we're trying to figure out the supreme principle of morality, what guides moral actions. And he says, it's not going to be enough to say something's morally good if it just fits in with the moral law. You just happen to do the right thing. What happens is you have to do it for the sake of this law. That's going to be what's moral. Why? Why do I have to do what's moral because it's moral? Why can't I do what's moral for some other reason? He says, look, if you're just doing what's moral for some other reason, that conformity, so conformity to the moral law, doing the right thing, is only contingent and precarious. So it's not firm, it's not sort of guaranteed, because the unmoral ground will now and then produce lawful actions, but more often actions contrary to the law. So what is this unmoral ground? So these are inclinations. So let's get a particular uh, moral principle to think about this. So let's say that the moral law says, I should give money to people who need money. I should give to the needy. Now, why should I give to the needy? Or what is the ground of that? What is the supreme principle that explains that? If you're Hume, you think it depends on inclination. The reason we need to give to the needy is that we have sympathy for the needy. I feel bad about the needy. And so morality tells me I should sort of act on my feelings and give money away to them. Morality is built on my sympathetic feelings for other people and so on. That's where generosity, for instance, comes from. Kant says no. If morality says to give away money and you are very sympathetic, so you give away money, it's true you conform to the moral law, but you're not doing it for the sake of the law. You're not doing it because you have to give away money. You're doing it because you feel bad about the people. And Kant says, look, that's just contingent and precarious. Right now, you feel sympathetic, so right now you give away money. But, number one, what if you lose your sympathetic feelings? Or, what if tomorrow your sympathetic feelings cause you to do something else? Your sympathetic feelings cause you to give money to some other cause rather than needy people. Maybe you feel bad about the Amazon rainforest burning down, and so you give money to that instead. Or maybe you feel sympathetic for uh, your sibling who uh, wasted a bunch of money gambling, and now they can't buy the things they want, so you give money to your sibling. Or maybe you feel sympathetic for yourself because you woke up in a bad mood, and so you say, I'm going to spend my money on myself today. And Kant says, look, those sorts of inclinations, so sympathy, it will now and then produce lawful actions. It will now and then get you to do the right thing, give money to the needy. But more often, actions contrary to the law. It'll make you give money to your sibling who wasted money on gambling, or to yourself because you feel bad for yourself. For Kant, inclination is not a firm basis for morality. Sometimes it'll get you to do the right thing, but not for the right reasons, just because you feel like doing it. And if it's just based on feeling, then your feelings can change or you, your feelings can get you to do the wrong thing. If you don't have the moral law in mind, if you don't have your duty in mind, you're not trying to do the right thing. You're just trying to do what you feel like doing. And so chances are you can end up doing the wrong thing. Kant thinks people who just act on their feelings, sometimes they do the right thing, but sometimes they do the wrong thing. Often they do the wrong thing. So he thinks feeling cannot be the basis for morality, or in other word, inclination, or wants, or desires, can't be the basis for morality. They're too sort of fickle, they're not firm enough, they aren't guaranteed to lead to the moral action. So that's the second reason. The first one, like I said, you'll read about when you do the reading and the reading quiz. 
these are, I think, two sort of interesting arguments. Uh, lots of people find them compelling. Kant gives a third later in the reading, 10 to 12, page 10 to 12. The reading quiz doesn't talk about this. Uh, you'll read it, so you'll sort of get the picture of it. But um, it's less good, <laughs> or at least people find it less convincing. So his argument that he gives on page 10 to 12 is that, look, if morality isn't based on an inclination, what's it going to be based on? Well, I think it's going to be based on reason. Kant says it's going to be based on reason or rationality. And so here's an argument for why rationality has to be about morality. Rationality, humans have it for some reason. It didn't just show up there by magic one day. There's some reason that humans are rational creatures. But if you have reason and a will, your preservation or your welfare, or in, in other words, your happiness, if that were the real end of human nature, of your rational nature, then nature would have hit on a very bad arrangement in appointing reason in this creature to accomplish the aim. So he says, look, if uh, happiness is the goal of human existence, rationality would be very bad at accomplishing the goal of human existence. Why? Um, well, he goes through the reasons, but the thought is that, look, if, you, if your goal is to be happy in life and you try to like reason your way there, it's just, it's not very effective. Like you can't just reason your way into happiness. And I think we all sort of know this. Being happy is about more than just sort of having the right rational uh, thoughts or having the right rational outlook. To be happy, you need much more in life. Uh, as Aristotle suggests, you have to maybe get lucky uh, to some extent. Often, if you try to reason your way through everything, that's going to be a terrible way of making decisions. So if you use rationality to sit down and decide what to eat, uh, your dinner is going to get cold before you decide what to eat. It's going to waste a lot of time. If you use rationality to decide like who to fall in love with or something, it's not even clear how this works. If you use rationality to try to like have fun playing a sport, it's just like what, what in the world? To get happiness, you have to follow your inclinations and your urges, your wants, your desires. Those are what make you happy. So Kant says, look, if rationality can't be for making us happy, what is it for? What is rationality for? Well, it must be for making us moral. Rationality can't exist to make us happy because it doesn't. It's just not very good at that. So it must be there. Nature must have put it in us to make us able to act morally. So that's his third kind of argument. Rationality fits with morality because that's its sort of natural link. Whereas inclinations and desires, those fit with happiness. Those are the natural link. I said people find this less compelling because you might think, look, rationality isn't there for like a reason. It's not like nature put it in us for some reason. It just evolved over time. Like there's no special reason humans are rational. It's just an accident. Um, so I remember like I took a course, I took many courses, but one of the courses I took as an undergraduate was Kant's moral philosophy. And I was doing the presentation for uh, this day when we read this part of the book and I came into class and I gave my presentation and one of the main questions I asked was like, I don't, this argument seems bad. Like, why do we have to assume nature gave us rationality for a purpose? And I remember my professor, she said like, yeah, nobody really likes this argument from Kant. He just, he got it from Rousseau and it doesn't seem very compelling. So people mostly ignore it. So um, that's why the reading quiz ignores it. Um, people tend to not find this one as compelling as the first two. But um, it's still interesting, and so if you want to think about it, that might be worth it. But uh, probably the only talk about it will be what we've just done. So those are the three reasons why inclination is not about morality. If inclination is not about morality, that leaves for Kant reason. So it's not our desires that explain morality. It's rationality or reason explains morality. And this brings us to the third topic, which is sort of the magic of Kant's moral system. So we get this sort of first introduction to Kant's moral system here in part one. And it's really interesting. How are you gonna build a moral system out of pure reason, out of the idea of rationality itself? And Kant says, well, 
look, if all I know about morality is that it has to be rational, and in fact, we're looking at pure reason, if you think back to the earlier lecture setting up Kant and deontology, this is pure reason. It's not empirical. There's no sort of investigation into the world. It's just what we can think about in our heads a priori. So what morality can you build from pure reason? What can your moral duties be from pure reason? Or what can the moral law be just based on pure reason? Well, if, it, if that's the only thing we know about morality, I guess it would be, it, I guess that means here's what morality must be. Morality, the moral law, must be something which, if you act morally, it could be rational for this to be the moral law. So if you are following some moral rule, it must be the case that rationally speaking, this could be a moral rule. So that sort of makes sense, right? If morality is based on rationality, then a moral rule must be one that we can rationally follow because how could it be irrational to follow a rule of morality based on rationality? And Kant thinks this, that like very abstract sounding, like just the moral rule has to be something which it could be rational for it to be a moral rule. He thinks that explains all of morality. Everything about morality follows from that principle. So that's really interesting. And how exactly this works, we get a taste of it in part one and then more discussion in part two. But for now, even before you read part one, or maybe after you read part one, while you read part one, this is something to puzzle over, or this is something to meditate on. What does it mean to say that morality, or the moral rule, is something that, if it's a moral rule, it would be rational to follow it? Kant thinks that's the entirety of morality, summed up right there. So we'll see how this works as we keep reading.